Welcome to part 4 of uh, the lecture on automatic parallelization. So, we looked at data dependence uh, framework in the last lecture. You know, uh, let us recapitulate a little bit because it is uh, very important. So, if you look at uh, the uh, loop, let us say the loop nest is of depth j, right, depth d, there are two statements S v and S w and uh, both of them have an array reference each. So, the first array reference is x with uh, the subscripts being f 1, f 2, f 3 etcetera, each of which is a function of i 1 to i d the loop uh, counter values. Similarly, S w has another uh, reference to the same array x with subscripts g 1, g 2, g 3 etcetera, each of which is again is a function of uh, i 1 to i d. So, the question is uh, whether these two references intersect and access the same memory location. First of all, we are not worried about the type of dependence to begin with. Any type of dependence is ok. First of all, uh, we determine whether there is a dependence at all and then refine it to see if it is uh, delta, delta bar, delta o etcetera, etcetera. And in this process, we also when we find the intersection, we also find the direction vector. So, the subscript uh, functions must be equal simultaneously, only then there is going to be an intersection. For all the you know subscript the uh, dimensions, the subscripts must have uh, equal values uh, f 1 equal to g 1, f 2 equal to g 2 etcetera, f s equal to g s. So, this must happen with the same values of i 1 to i d, otherwise uh, the intersection cannot happen. So, we start with uh, the most general direction vector star comma star comma etcetera. We can uh, apply the Banerjee's test or uh, the GCD test at this level. So, if we prove independence at this level, nothing more to do, then you know there will be no intersection at all. And uh, if the if there is dependence as proven by the Banerjee or uh, GCD test, one of the stars must be expanded you know. So, here we have an example with star comma star, suppose the dependence is proven to be true, it is conservative. So, we expand first star to less than and then try less than comma star equal to comma star and uh, greater than comma star. So, each of these is going to be tested with uh, Banerjee's test. So, depending on which one of these uh, returns uh, independence, we do not you know actually expand that tree. Suppose, this will be obviously always independent returns independence because first component is greater than. So, we do not have to do these three tests at all, but suppose this also returns independence then this will also not be expanded further only this will be expanded. So, then we test each of these three direction vectors and we apply Banerjee's test see which one of these is actually true. So, we also defined the uh, complement and uh, product of uh, direction vectors these are needed to compute uh, psi inverse and so and psi, uh, psi 1 cross psi d etcetera, etcetera. So, if psi k is this then psi k inverse is defined to be the complement if it is less than then psi k inverse is greater than etcetera, etcetera. And with the product we simply take the two uh, you know direction vectors psi 1 and psi 2 take the products uh, of the components where the product of the components is defined in this table. So, one of them is less than the other one is less than it is less than if it is less than and equal to it is uh, nil that means, it is illegal uh, you know type of direction vector at this point and so on. So, once uh, we know this how do we use it? So, we actually compute the product of uh, different direction vectors belonging to the various uh, subscripts you know various dimensions uh, have uh, various subscripts. So, we compute the product which indi really indicates intersection of all these direction vectors. So, that is done uh, you know as psi 1 cross psi 2 etcetera, etcetera. If this combination produces any dot entries, then there is no simultaneous intersection of all these subscripts. So, we can say there is no dependence and they will never intersect, but if uh, all the entries are valid we need to find the actual dependence. So, this can be done by intersecting the direction vector that we get here 
with the execution order direction vector for that particular construct. So, depending on which type of a loop it is, we would have uh, computed the direction vector uh, psi of uh, v to w by looking at the syntax of uh, the loop. So, we intersect it with uh, you know uh, rather the omega, omega v to w is the execution order direction vector. So, we intersect it with psi to get the direction vector from v to w that is we are assuming that now the dependence is from S v to S w because uh, this is dictated by the omega. Okay. So, if uh, this provides any nil entries then there is no dependence from S v to S w otherwise whatever is uh, given as uh, the direction vector will give you the dependence from S v to S w. So, in that case we still have not found the type of dependence delta, delta bar and delta O that is actually you know decided uh, by looking at the position of the two statements. Okay. So, uh, if the you know we know flow dependence means S v is on left side and S w is on right side and so on and so forth. So, if uh, some of the entries are nil then we need to check whether there is dependence from S w to S v. So, we compute psi inverse and then intersect it with omega w to v, w to v again would have been computed using the execution order uh, you know direction vector that is what this is. So, we would have computed this as the direction vector of the execution order using the syntax of the construct. So, psi inverse we know how to compute, so we know how to compute the direction vector from w to v. So, now if all the entries are valid we add uh, S w delta star w to v and del, uh, which type of dependence that is decided by the position of the two references. So, now let us look at the second example we saw one example last time. So, here there are two loops, but uh, a is a single dimensional array it uses both loop counters. So, the expression is uh, i star 10 plus j on the left side and i star 10 plus j minus 1 on the right side. So, the dependence equation is uh, 10 i 1 plus j 1 minus 10 i 2 plus j 2 minus j 2 equal to minus 1. Okay. So, that would be so this is transfer to the left side that is why this becomes uh, 10 i 1 plus j 1 minus 10 i 2 minus j 2 and this remains on the right side. So, that is minus 1. Now, the GCD test uh, says yes dependence exists and that would be with the star comma star. Now, we need to apply the Banerjee's test and the dependence framework. So, let us uh, you know this is how we compute all the required uh, uh, you know lower and upper bounds for star less than equal to greater than etcetera etcetera. So, for the both the indices i and j. So, the formulas uh, we looked at in the last class itself. So, once we compute those we can check the constraints at the various levels. At this level the constraints are some of the L b's of i j with star as the direction vector must be less than or equal to b naught minus a naught and that must in turn be less than or equal to the sum of the u b's of i and j with star as the direction vector. So, this will be easily satisfied. So, we can see that. So, we expand the left. Okay. So, the left star. So, we have less than star equal to star and greater than star. This is not a feasible thing. So, not possible. So, we stop at this point. Whereas, here this returns true minus 99 less than or equal to minus 1 less than or equal to minus 1 that is true. So, we expanded the second star again and checked all the three dependences using Banerjee's test. Two of them returned false and the one returned yes. So, here again this returned yes and the other two returned false. So, these are the only two direction vectors which may be possible e less than greater than and equal to less than it is not yet decided. So, now there is only one subscript. So, there is no need to do any intersection of the two subscripts at all okay, since there is only one. Now, the execution order dependence uh, direction vectors are all given for that single loop we know that S 1 theta equal to less than or equal to S 2 S 2 theta equal to less than S 1 s 1 theta less than star uh, com, less than comma star s 2 s 2 theta less than comma star s 1 are all possible. So, we are going to actually look at less than greater than. So, any of these uh, with first component less than 
will be useful. Anything with uh, something other than less than will return a null entry. So, less than comma star s 1 theta less than comma star s 2 is possible. So, the when we intersect we just get the same less than greater than. So, when we look at equal to comma less than again the unless the first one is less than or equal to or equal to there is no point in intersecting it. So, we have equal to and less than or equal to here s 1 theta equal to less than or equal to. So, that gives us the same vector equal to and less than. So, all other products are dot values, but there are two of them which are not dot. So, these are indeed the dependences with these direction vectors. So, we have possibly s 1 delta equal to comma less than s 2 and s 1 delta less than comma greater than s 2. So, the position of uh, the two references already indicates see for example, s 1 has this on the left side and s 2 has this on the right side. So, it indicates that uh, it is a delta not delta bar or delta o and since this has been proven true there is no need to test s 2 delta star s 1. Okay. So, that is how uh, we use the dependence framework and uh, Banerjee's test to compute the dependences in uh, more complicated uh, expressions and loops. So, that is about uh, the dependence framework. Now, let us see what uh, can be done about parallelization, concurrentization, etcetera, etcetera. So, this statement I already mentioned a few lectures ago. If all the dependence relations in a loop nest have a direction vector value of equal to in a loop, then the iterations of uh, that loop can be executed in parallel with no synchronization between the iterations. So, each iteration you know within the iteration the order of statements is going to be the same as uh, in the program. We are not going to change the order of the statements unnecessarily. So, if we do that if since uh, all the dependences at that level are equal to we can simply execute that loop in parallel no violations will occur. And uh, this is the very profound result even though it looks uh, non intuitive any dependence with a forward direction vector in an outer loop will be satisfied by the serial execution of the outer loop. So, if an outer loop L is in, run in sequential mode then all the dependences with a forward direction at the outer level will be automatically satisfied. So, if this is so even for the inner loops of uh, L. I will show you an example for this, but if the outer loop has a dependence equal to then whatever is said here will not be true. Even if the outer loop is run in sequential mode the dependences may not be completely satisfied. So, let us take this example i equal to 2 to n then j equal to 2 to n s 1 has a i j equal to b i j plus 2 and S 2 has B i j equal to A i minus 1 j minus 1 minus B i j. So, the uh, one of some of these ob, uh, dependences are obvious this A i j and this A i j A minus 1 j minus 1 have a dependence. So, you know so this is this is when this is uh, 2 this is 1 this is when this is 3 this is 2 etcetera etcetera. Similarly, when this is 2 this is 1 this is when this is 3 this is 2 etcetera etcetera. So, both these dependences are uh, carried forward. So, S 1 delta less than less than S 2 is because of these two references. Then we have uh, this and this the indices are the same the subscripts are the same. So, this will have uh, actually a, an anti dependence with uh, S 2 uh, you know uh, S 1 delta bar S 2 with both the direction vector components being equal to and equal to. Finally, we have uh, this and this okay, in same S 2. So, this is B i j this is also B i j. So, this is read first and then written into. So, it is an anti dependence from S 2 to S 2 with equal to and equal to. Let us expand the loop. So, we get a 2 2 equal to a 1 1 equal to etcetera and for various values of j under various values of i. So, we have uh, a less than in the outer loop between S 1 and S 2. Okay. So, that dependence uh, has a less than whereas, uh, for the others S 1 and S 2 it is equal to and S 2 and S 2 also it is equal to. So, this i loop 
cannot be run in parallel, it should have been equal to. Now, suppose we you know run the i loop in uh, sequential mode. Okay. So, even the j loop cannot be run in parallel because uh, s 1 delta less than less than s 2 has the second loop uh, second component also as less than, but uh, let us observe something. Let us run the i loop in sequential mode that means, i loop will run like this with j equal to 1, j equal to 2 etcetera etcetera and then i equal to 2 will be run etcetera etcetera equal to 3 and so on and so forth. Let us see if the if we run i loop sequentially and uh, if we run the j loop uh, in parallel, we have j equal to 1, j equal to 2, j equal to 3 etcetera all of them running in parallel. Okay. So, that is what it really means. So, all these will run in parallel, all these will run in parallel, but these will begin only after these complete. So, that is sequential for i parallel for j. So, if that happens, let us see if the dependences get satisfied. So, between s 1 and s 2 there is delta less than less than. So, let us see where that is. So, a 2 2 is here and a 2 2 is here. So, since uh, this is going to run first and then this automatically this will be computed first and then this would be computed and this particular uh, dependence would be automatically satisfied. See that uh, even if we run j s in parallel it would be only here and not across. So, this will be computed and then use and this particular uh, dependence would be automatically satisfied. This poses no problem because it is equal to equal to in both directions. So, we have uh, very little to worry about s 1 delta bar uh, s 2 and uh, that would be only you know between s 1 and s 2 in the same iteration of uh, i and j. So, that would be automatically satisfied. Then uh, this is also between S2 and S2 in the say you know with equal to equal to. So, that means uh, it is in the same iteration of uh, i and j. So, this will be also be automatically satisfied even if we run uh, j in parallel that it will there will be nothing wrong. So, when we ran i loop in uh, sequential mode this second component which is less than also got automatically satisfied that is what we really said here. So, any dependence with less than forward less than direction vector in an outer loop will be satisfied by the serial execution of the outer loop that is obvious, but then the second one said if we run the outer loop in sequential mode then all other uh, inner loops can be run in parallel mode provided the outer loop had a less than direction vector. So, that is true. So, the outer loop had less than inner loop also had less than, but uh, once we ran the outer loop in sequential mode, inner loop could also be run in parallel mode. So, that is very important. So, let us look at another example. So, here we have i equal to 2 to n and j equal to 2 to n. So, a i j is b i j plus 2, b i j is a i comma j minus 1 minus b i j. So, we have uh, between s 1 and s 2, we have dependence between these two and that is s 1 delta equal to comma less than s 2 that is between these two i and i are the same j and j minus 1 give less than. S 1 delta bar S 2 and uh, S 2 delta bar S 2 remain the same as before no change. Now, we can run the i loop in parallel because the first component is uh, equal to in all of them okay, no problem, but uh, the second loop cannot be run in parallel the second loop has less than as the direction vector component. What I want to show you here is even if we run the i loop in uh, sequential mode, you cannot run the j loop in parallel mode that is what really is the problem. So, let us say we run the i loop in sequential mode. So, this gets run first and then this and so on and so forth. So, the dependence uh, s 1 delta e equal to comma less than s 2 is here it is between this and this. So, even if we run uh, i equal to 1 and then i equal to 2 etcetera, if we run j 1, j 2, j 3 etcetera in parallel this dependence will be violated. That is the reason why we cannot run the j loop in parallel mode and uh, it does not matter whether we run the uh, outer loop in parallel mode or sequential mode. 
So, if we run the I loop in uh, parallel mode, then you know these iterations get run in parallel and the j loops will all be run in sequential mode. So, automatically the dependence will be satisfied. Now, let us look at some of the loop transformations for increasing parallelism. What we have seen so far are uh, to check whether existing loops can be run in parallel mode or in uh, sequential mode. We did not propose any uh, transformations which can change the loop and make it possible to run it in parallel mode. So, we know that cycles that is recurrences create problems. So, recurrence breaking is one of the loop transformations. So, within that there are many of them ignorable cycles scalar expansion, scalar renaming, node splitting, threshold detection and index set splitting, if conversion. So, we will see one example of each. Then loop interchange change is a very important uh, transformation, loop fission and finally, loop fusion. So, what are ignorable cycles? It says any single statement recurrence based on delta may be ignored. So, in a, uh, let us take this example x of i minus 1 equal to f of x of i, i runs from 2 to 100. So, what has happened is uh, this uh, if you expand this, this becomes x 2 equal to f of x 1, x 3 equal to f of x 2 etcetera. So, that means, there is a dependence. Okay. So, you will have to read this first and then you know this will be x uh, let us say i equal to 2. So, this becomes x 1 right sorry I mean, uh, this is x 1 and this is x 2 this is x 3 and this is uh, you know uh, the, for i equal to 2 uh, 3 this becomes x 2 and this becomes x 3 and so on and so forth. So, we would have read the x i first and then written into x i. So, x 2 is read and then written into in the next iteration. So, if this happens there is a dependence from S to S, but that is an anti dependence. So, what the statement uh, says is if it is an anti dependence on the same statement then it can be ignored. That is because the even if it is uh, vectorized the semantics of the statement say the right hand side must be fetched first evaluated first and then the left hand side should be written into and that is precisely what this is uh, really saying. So, there is nothing wrong in uh, you know and the observe that this is reading ahead and then writing it to it. it nowhere does it actually read something which has been computed in some other cycle. So, because of that this uh, is perfectly ok x 2 to 100 you know reads all the values puts them in some buffer and then uh, computes the function f on it and finally, assigns uh, x 1 to 99 uh, to these uh, you know are assigned these values. Okay. So, there is no violation of any dependence here that is why any single statement uh, recurrence based on delta may be ignored, but it must be delta sorry delta bar may be ignored. So, what is scalar expansion again it is very intuitive. So, let us take this loop i equal to 1 to n s 1 is t equal to a i s 2 is a i equal to b i and s 3 is b i equal to t. t is a scalar a and b are arrays. So, now it is easy to see that from you know, this, this is the dependence diagram s 1 to s 3 there is a flow dependence. So, s 1 to s 3 there is a uh, you know s 1 to s 3 right there is a flow dependence t is computed here and t is used here, but then if you expand uh, this particular loop once there will be another s 1 s 2 s 3 here and uh, the next iteration i equal to 2 would have s 1 with t equal to a of 2. So, this t and the next t would be tied together there is a dependence that would be an anti dependence this is reading here and that is writing there. So, we have uh, from s 3 to s 1 an anti dependence with less than. So, this was i equal to 1 the next one would be i equal to 2. So, that is another. Then we have uh, 
you know a dependence from S 1 to S 1. So, again look at the expanded version of this there would be another S 1, S 2, S 3 with t. So, that t the t the which is in the next S 1 and the t in this S 1 would have an output dependence and so that is what is shown here. And obviously, between S 1 and S 2 there is an anti dependence and between S 2 and S 3 there is another anti dependence. So, this is your uh, diagram it has uh, many cycles one here and another here. So, this cannot be vectorized that is very clear. Now, suppose we do not want this you know uh, problem and we replace t with a vector. So, let us say t becomes uh, t x. So, this is called scalar expansion t is a scalar it was expanded to a vector. So, instead of using the same t again and again we are using different locations of uh, the array t x. So, instead of t equal to a i we have t x of i equal to a i and instead of b i equal to t which is supposed to use the same value of t we have b i equal to t x of i. The advantage with this is some of the dependences go away. So, for example, from s 1 to s 2 the dependence between these a i s remains the dependence from S 2 to S 3 between the B i's also remains, but when you look at the output dependence on S 1 it disappears because uh, we are not going to write into the same location again and again. This is T x of i it writes into T x 1, 2, 3, 4 etcetera it never writes into the same location. So, this particular uh, loop you know that the self dependence has gone. Then we also do not have uh, the output dependence from S 3 to S 1 you know remember B i equal to t and then the next S 1 would have t equal to a i. So, that anti dependence was present here, but that does not exist here because uh, the same location is never written into in i equal to 2 it would have been uh, t x of 2. So, this S 3 to S 1 disappears what we have is just S 1 to S 3 with delta equal to. So, that is because this and this are the same. So, this is the delta equal to that we are talking about. This code can be vectorized absolutely no problem, but then you know during uh, parallelization we do not need such vectors. What we really do is each of these iterations is going to run as a thread that is what uh, real parallelization is all about. So, we say that uh, at this variable uh, t which is here is a thread private variable called temp. So, in such a case the program remains as is is temp equal to a i a equal to b i and uh, b i equal to temp, but for i equal to 1 it is temp 1 which is private to the thread for i equal to 1 and for i equal to 2 it would be temp 2 which is different from temp 1 and temp 2 is private to the thread owning i equal to 2. So, that is how this for all loop executes with the temp as private to the thread corresponding to a particular iteration value. So, if that is so this particular uh, diagram still holds. Okay. So, we do not have any cycles and it can be run in uh, parallel mode. But then scalar expansion is not always uh, profitable or beneficial let us look at an example i equal to 1 to n s 1 is t equal to t plus a i plus a i plus 2 and s 2 is a i equal to t. So, if you draw the dependence diagram for this particular loop. So, of course, we have uh, the anti dependence between these two t's. So, that is here. So, what was computed in the previous iteration is used here. Okay. Then we have many other dependences. So, between uh, S 1 and S 2 we have this anti dependence A i and A i. So, between S 1 and S 2 there is an anti dependence. So, that is from here. Okay. Then we have uh, a i plus 2 and a i. So, this is if you have a i equal to 1 you would have a 3 a 1 a 2 
you know a 4, a 2, a 5, a 3 and so on and so forth. So, that is a anti dependence from s 1 to s 2 with less than as the direction vector. So, s 1 to s 2 with anti dependence okay. that is another. Then of course, you have uh, this dependence from s 1 to s 2. So, which is uh, a flow dependence with equal to direction uh, vector. So, that is also from uh, s 1 to s 2. So, that already exists. Okay. So, so that is here. All right. Then we have uh, you know so th this uh, so there are many dependences. So, this is if you expand this we have another s 1 s 2. So, there would be another flow depend uh, you know anti dependence from s 2 to s 1 as well. So, we have uh, this dependence from s 2 to s 1. So, that is uh, an anti dependence with less than direction vector. So, these are the various uh, dependences that we have uh, in this particular uh, program. Obviously, we have a cycle right. So, it is not vectorizable. Suppose, we do scalar expansion that is expand this t to an array you get t x of i equal to t x of uh, i minus 1 plus a i plus a i plus 2 a i equal to t x i. So, with this we get this particular uh, dependence diagram that is you have uh, these some of these dependences remain the anti dependence is the problem you know sorry the anti dependence here is the problem. So, we have uh, you know t x i equal to t x of i minus 1 plus something. So, we still have a dependence from d x of i minus 1 to d x s 1 to s 1 and now this becomes a delta less than. It was actually uh, you know a delta bar before, but now because it is a uh, an array we are using the old value and uh, computing a new value here. So, this becomes a delta less than. So, there is another loop here. Otherwise, the previous loop went away the so delta equal to remains delta bar equal to remains delta bar less than uh, remains, but then uh, you know this also uh, remains. Okay. But uh, you should observe that uh, this particular s 2 to s 1 actually has uh, reversed. Okay. So, s 2 to s 1 there is no dependence anymore that is a dependence from s 1 to s 2 with uh, equal to as the direction vector it was less than before but now it is equal to okay so so that's that's the difference between uh, this loop and uh, this loop some of these uh, dependences have changed some of them have vanished but this loop has changed to a worse actually it's delta less than and it was a delta bar less than before so even after you know variable uh, scalar variable expansion we still have a loop and this loop cannot be vectorized so, even though scalar uh, expansion is always legal, it may not be profitable. So, that is the moral of this particular uh, slide. The next one is scalar renaming. So, you have this program with S1, S2, S3, S4. Now, you have an output dependence from S1 to S3, t equal to something and t equal to something here also. So, the output dependence S1 delta O S3 just cannot be broken by scalar expansion. Why? You have T i equal to something here and T i equal to something here. So, they both write into the same location of uh, the array output dependence does not vary at all. The trick here is uh, we should actually use a different temporary and not use the same temporary. So, first one becomes T 1, the second one becomes T 2. So, this dependence is from T 1 to T 1 here and the second dependence is from t 2 to t 2. Once we do that this particular uh, program can benefit by scalar uh, expansion. So, we now make t 1 into a vector and we also make t 2 into a vector automatically the scalar uh, program you know can be converted to a vector program with the t 2 1 to 100 equal to something etcetera etcetera etcetera. So, why is uh, T 2 coming first and you know why is S 3, S 4 the order uh, you know why is it in this order S 3, S 4, S 1, S 2. Well, uh, that is just that uh, the dependences have to be satisfied appropriately 
and that is the reason why we have. So, this S 4 is computing something and then supplying it to S 1 that is the reason why S 3 and S 4 come first and then uh, because S 1 and S 2 are dependent on it they come later. Okay. Finally, the value of for t is t 2 of 100 that should be retained as it is. So, scalar renaming and scalar uh, expansion are two different uh, transformations and they may be applied uh, together as well. Then we come to node splitting. So, suppose uh, there is a cycle consisting of an anti dependence. So, if we split a node we may be able to get away with this uh, you know uh, dependence and then uh, we may be able to actually factorize the program. But then we are going to introduce a new array. So, there is a sp space explosion possible. So, let us take an example i equal to 1 to 100. So, s 1 is a i equal to x i plus 1 plus x i and s 2 is x i plus 1 equal to b i. So, there is a dependence uh, cycle between these two. So, s 1 so, uh, S 1 to S 2 there is a delta bar right. So, X i plus 1 uh, is read here and X i plus 1 is written into. So, that is the delta bar cycle between S 2 and S 1 this is writing into X 2 this is reading from X 1 then this writes writes into X 3 and this reads X 2. So, that means there is a dependence of the flow type between S 2 and S 1. So, there is a dependence from S 2 to S 1 with delta this is a cycle. We, know, we can never get rid of delta anyway. So, if we break this you know uh, into S 1 into 2 let us see what happens. We get S 0 T i equal to x i plus 1. So, this part is assigned to a temporary then we have a i equal to T i plus x i. So, instead of x i plus 1 and then x i plus 1 equal to b i. So, we have broken S 1 into two statements S 0 and S 1 let us see what happens here. So, between uh, S 0 and S 1 there is an anti dependence for the T i right S 0 sorry the flow dependence between uh, this T i and this T i. So, that is here and then we have uh, from S 0 uh, you know this particular uh, x i plus 1 and this x i plus 1 have an anti dependence. So, that remains as it is and then we have uh, you know the between S 1 and S 2 we have a flow dependence from S 2 to S 1. Okay. So, we because we broke this uh, node into 2 now the dependence cycle has vanished. So, there is no cycle both these dependences from S 0 and S 2 to S 1 actually are in the same direction towards S 1. So, there is no cycle at all and this loop can be vectorized now. So, we have T 1 1 to 100 equal to etcetera etcetera. So, vectorization uh, works here. So, this is another important in the transformation remember if you have an anti dependence uh, cycle we can try to break it using node splitting. So, if there are thresholds sometimes uh, you know we detect thresholds they can be used for vectorization as such. So, if you take this program with a loop which has one statement x i plus y equal to x i if you observe it once you cross the value 5 you know you would have written x 6 equal to x 1 x 7 equal to x 2 x 8 equal to um, you know uh, x 3 etcetera etcetera. Then we have uh, x 5 plus 5 x 10 equal to x 5 and then you get x 11 equal to x 6. So, you have written x 6 in the first iteration and then uh, you know in the sixth iteration you are using x 6. So, that means there is a flow dependence uh, with this and that flow dependence actually can be somehow uh, gotten rid of by if we detect that the threshold value is 5. So, we divide the loop into two the first loop runs from i to i equal to 1 to 20 second loop runs from j equal to 1 to 5 and inside we have x of i star 5 plus j equal to i star 5 plus j minus 5. So, it is the same loop which is just that we have two loop indices here. So, the index values of x here and here will be the same. 
they will become the same actually, uh, they value the same as i plus 5 and i respectively. Once we have this, the j loop can be vectorized. So, there is no dependence uh, at the j level, so we can vectorize uh, the j loop and the i loop is run in sequential mode. So, we have a very short vector, but still something is better than nothing. So, we have reduced this uh, uh, you know iteration space rather than the number of iterations to 20. So, if here the threshold value is 50 i equal to 1 to 100 a i equal to 101 minus i. So, up to 50 the dependence is in one direction okay. after 50 the dependence uh, becomes uh, in the other direction. So, because of that you cannot factorize it as it is. But once you divide the loop into two parts, i equal to 1 to 2 and then j equal to 1 to 50, you can um, you know uh, vectorize the j loop and uh, run the i loop in uh, you know so rather the other way, you can uh, vectorize the i loop and uh, run the j loop 1 to 2 in sequential mode. Okay. So, that is what we have uh, shown here. So, that is about uh, thresholds. And uh, the next transformation that we consider is the if conversion. So, here the problem is uh, you have conditions in the program and if there are conditions then the control can flow in any direction. It can if the condition is true it uh, flows in one direction and if the condition is false it flows in the other direction. Because of this, there is no way we can actually run in uh, vector mode. So, as it is, if there are branches, there can be no vectorization possible. So, a solution to this is to compute the condition also as a vector, and uh, for example, here you know if i less than or equal to 0, then continue. So, a i equal to b i plus 3. So, if a i is greater than 0, then we execute this, otherwise uh, we just go to the next iteration of the loop. So, what we do is uh, we compute a vector b r i equal to a i less than or equal to 0. So, b r 1 stores a 1 less than or equal to 0, b r 2 stores a 2 less than or equal to 0 and so on and so forth. And then we use this uh, b r i as a mask wherever uh, b r i is set as true the you know for example, uh, not of b r i okay, is true whenever b r i is false and it is false whenever b r i is true. So, here we wanted to execute a i equal to b i plus 3 whenever a i is greater than 0 that is whenever b r i is false. So, we added a mask here whenever uh, this particular thing has uh, not of b r i that is uh, the b r i bit is set to 0, then the mask for this particular instruction is also set as 1 and the instruction gets executed. So, there must be some hardware support for it. If this uh, b r i is set as true then not of b r i becomes 0. So, this particular instruction a i equal to b i plus 3 will not be executed. So, there is a mask which executes the instruction if it is set to 1, it does not execute the instruction if it is set to 0. So, with that hardware you know uh, we can actually vectorize this uh, particular loop. So, b r 1 to n is a 1 to n less than or equal to 0. So, that is a vector and uh, if not of b r 1 to n. So, this is a mask a 1 to n equal to b 1 to n plus 3. So, if this is possible you know then uh, this masking is useful. Another bigger example we have 4 sentences and a condition inside with 2 sentences inside the condition. So, if this condition is true we want to execute both. So, first of all we execute the condition you know rather compute the condition as a vector. Next we have a you know uh, masked statement where temp 1 colon n execute d 2 something okay. So, in vector mode then again we have uh, s 1 
a 1 to n equal to d 1 n plus 1 and another mass statement where temp 1 colon n c 1 colon n equal to etcetera, etcetera. So, this reordering of statements is because of this particular uh, dependence diagram where this c shows uh, control dependence. So, for example, if b i greater than 0 is the condition s 3 and s 4 are dependent on it. So, that is why there is an arc from s 2 to s 3 this is the condition and s 2 to s 4. Okay. So, once we have this mask you know uh, automatically we can reorder statements assuming that this conditional dependence uh, has gone. So, in other words uh, this is gone. So, we can execute s 2 first which does not have any predecessors, but then you cannot execute s 3 you will have to execute s 4 which does not have any predecessors. Now, then s 1 and finally, s 3. So, that is how the uh, conversion of uh, if statements helps in vectorization. Loop interchange is a very important uh, transformation. So, let us understand uh, loop inter uh, you know what we really do is uh, if there is a loop i outside and another loop j inside, we actually check whether uh, you know i or j loop can be run in vector or parallel mode. If it cannot be, then we check a condition and see if the i and j loop can be swapped. So, the j becomes uh, the outer loop and i becomes the inner loop. Now, it may be possible to execute one or more of these loops in vector or concurrent mode. So, that is the uh, motivation for uh, the loop interchange. Now, there are uh, three very simple conditions for uh, simple loop interchange loops L 1 and L 2 must be tightly nested, no statements between the loops. So, all statements are in both L 1 and L 2, there are no statements in L 1 which are not in L 2. The loop limits of L 2 must be invariant in uh, L 1. So, in other words uh, you know you cannot have uh, the inner loop uh, uh, you know limit dependent on the outer loop uh, index. There are no statements S V and S W not necessarily distinct in the L 1 which is the outer loop with a dependence S V delta star less than comma greater than S W. So, what really has happened is uh, if you try to swap the loops L 1 and L 2 this dependence uh, this is the intuition reverses. So, we should really get greater than comma less than which is an illegal loop direction vector and that is the reason why we should not have such a dependence. Uh, in the first place if you want to do loop interchange. So, for example, in this loop the inner loop is not uh, vectorizable. So, we have this dependence s to s with the less than in the inner loop. Now, if we swap the two loops i becomes the inner loop and j becomes the outer loop the dependence changes less than and equal to. So, now the inner loop is uh, definitely vectorizable. In the in this case outer loop can be run in parallel but in this case the outer loop cannot be run in parallel. Here the dependence from s to s is uh, e less than and equal to. So, you cannot run the outer loop in parallel mode. So, let us see if you can uh, swap you can because there is nothing like less than greater than. So, once we do that uh, it becomes equal to and less than you can uh, actually out, uh, parallelize the outer loop. So, in vectorization you know you really have to have uh, only one statement inside the uh, you cannot have out vectorize the outer loop because you cannot run a complete loop in vector you know as a vector uh, instruction ok. A single uh, in a in a, a vector instruction cannot be a complete loop in other words. And uh, in the case of concurrentization if you actually have very less work for the outer loop you know uh, suppose you vectorize the inner loop. Okay. Now, there is very less work for the inner loop just this statement. So, there may be too much overhead in executing such iterations in parallel, but once you swap and the outer loop becomes uh, parallelizable for each one of the iterations parallel iterations you know uh, threads of the outer loop we have a complete loop the I complete i loop runs in sequential mode. So, there is more work per thread and therefore, this is desirable for uh, parallelization. So, what is the intuition behind this uh, loop interchange? 
So, if you have the, this is the iteration space S 1 1, S 1 2, S 1 3, S 2 1, S 2 2, S 2 3, etcetera, etcetera. To begin with, uh, these are the dependences, okay. so the 1 2, S 3 1 to S 3 2, etcetera. And when we are running sequentially, these dotted lines indicate how we go. So, we go from S 1 1 to S 1 2 to S 1 3, then to S 2 1 to S 2 2 to S 2 3, etcetera, etcetera. And if you actually interchange the loops, we are going to run in this direction. Okay. So, the other in index runs uh, more frequently. So, this is a legal loop interchange. Why? In the original case, we had to compute S 1 1 first and then S 1 2 and then S 1 3, then S 2 1, S 2 2, S 2 3, etcetera. If you run in this order, there is no dependence between S 1 2 and S 2 1. So, no dependences, uh, the dependences are all in this direction only. So, if you execute all these in uh, and then come to these and so on, there is no violation of dependence. So, loop interchange is uh, legal. If you have a dependence from this to this, then instead of running in this direction, if you try running in this direction, you will not be executing this before this. So, there is a violation of dependence. So, this is an example of a loop uh, illegal loop interchange that is you have less than and greater than this is the kind of dependence you would have. So, you will have a dependence in this direction which cannot you know permit loop interchange. Loop interchange is not always beneficial. So, if you have a loop uh, you know dependences in both directions instead of just one, then loop uh, interchange will still not help you, you cannot parallelize the loop. Whereas, uh, in this case when we said loop interchange is uh, permitted, you could have run this entire thing you know the outer loop s delta equal to comma less than right. So, this is uh, this is the way it was. So, we were running in sequential mode. So, we could run this entire thing in parallel, this entire thing in parallel and this entire thing in parallel and the dependences would have been satisfied. So, that is what uh, this really was. So, loop fission is uh, dividing a given loop into two parts. So, you have a single loop here, this loop cannot be vectorized as it is. Suppose, you divide it into two parts, so that uh, no violation of dependences occur, then this loop can be vectorized, but this loop cannot be vectorized, but at least partially you are able to vectorize one part of the loop, if not both loops. So, what exactly is the condition for loop fission? If a loop contains statements s k and s j, where s k follows s j in the loop. So, in other words uh, s j comes first and then s k okay. and there is a dependence s k to s j with a delta less than. Okay. So, that means there is a backward dependence. So, s j comes first and then s k, but the dependence is from s k to s j in the backward direction. Then loop fission may not split the loop at any point between s j and s k. So, let us see what this really is. So, you have a loop like this, we have uh, the dependence from S 1 to S 3 and S 2 to S 3. Now, S 2 and S 3 are here, sorry the dependence is from S 3 to S 2 with a delta less than, okay. that is what this said, this is the way it was. So, we have a dependence from here to here, but S 2 and S 3 are in uh, sequence, okay. S 3 comes after S 2. So, if you try to break the loop between these two points, there is a violation of the lemma and the loop uh, fission is said to be illegal. How does that uh, show here? Suppose, we divide the loop here at this point. Okay. Now, this a i and this a i okay, are ok, but uh, whatever is computed in S 3 as c i plus 1 will never be fed to S 2 as c i. Okay. So, this entire thing will compute using the old values of c i and then the new values of c i would be computed if you divide the loop between S 2 and S 3 which is illegal. Whereas, in this case there are no such uh, backward dependences between S 3 and S 2 there is no backward dependence, between S 1 and S 2 there is no backward dependence. So, the loop can be cut either here or here or in both places and it will still be a valid uh, loop fission. The last one is the loop fusion. So, they must have the same index sets let loops must be adjacent, no conditional branches in either loop. I O only in one of the loops is permitted, not in both, 
and data dependence requirement must be taken care of. So, if you have loops like this and if the loops do not run with the same index set, this is runs from 1 to n, this runs from 2 to n, obviously we cannot fuse these two. But you can make sure that the uh, loop uh, index sets are the same, you know, you, you can say for example, uh, this can become if i greater than equal to then d i equal to i, I star 2 and run it from 1 to n. Okay. So, otherwise you could uh, change the loop 2 as uh, i equal to 1 to n d i plus 1 equal to e i plus 1 star 2. So, you change this loop expression here, okay, subscript expression. So, if we, we if we do that then we can fuse the loop. So, for example, in this case we simply peeled the loop a 1 equal to b 1 plus c 1 and ran the loop from i equal to 2 to n. So, this loop, okay. so sorry this loop. Uh, now, this loop also runs from a 2 to n. So, it can be merged with this particular loop. So, illegal uh, loop fusion is like this. So, suppose you have two loops S 1 and uh, S 2. So, you, if you merge these two loops, what really has happened is uh, the dependence has changed. So, when we had the loops separate, we computed uh, you know uh, a i here equal to b i plus c i and b i plus 1 equal to d i star 2 was computed here. So, this was actually an anti dependence, all the b's were used and then the b's were computed. But once you fuse the loops, the value computed here is fed to S 1. So, it the uh, dependence has really changed. So, because of this, uh, you know it is uh, uh, not always possible to uh, really uh, fuse the loops. You uh, really have to look at uh, the dependence from one loop to another. For example, there is a dependence from uh, S 2 S 1 to S 2, it is an anti dependence this is b 1, b 2, b 3 etcetera and this is b 2, b 3, b 4 etcetera. And uh, because s 1 is completed first and then s 2, it becomes an anti dependence. Whereas, uh, when you fuse the loops, it really becomes uh, a flow dependence from s 2 to s 1. So, because of such reasons, loop fusion is not always uh, legal. So, this is uh, just to give you a sampler of uh, various uh, you know loop transformations that occur in uh, practice. So, this is the end of uh, the parallelization uh, part of uh, our uh, course. So, in the next lecture we will begin with uh, instruction scheduling etcetera. Thank you.